isn't it? So what goes on around us, it really doesn't matter. What happens is a right heart and a right response is what makes a difference. Father, for everybody that needed prayer and everybody that is believing you for a touch, we just thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So those of you that uh, might, this might be your first installment in this series. This is week number seven in the questions series, and we're answering questions. A lot of times we have questions, and maybe we're afraid to ask the question, or maybe uh, we're embarrassed that, oh, I should know this already, but there's no wrong question. The only wrong one is the one you don't ask, all right? And so we've gone a little bit further in this series than I thought we would, but you guys keep submitting more questions. And let me share with you a couple things we're going to do. We're going to have one session at the very end where we do instant questions. I've, on these, you've submitted the question, I've studied the question, I've researched the questions, and then I'll answer them. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to give you a, once the electronics works again, <laughs> we'll do we'll do where you can text a question and we'll do some spontaneous questions uh, and try to answer them that way. It could be embarrassing. It might be fun. I don't know. We'll, we'll try it, though. We're not afraid to, to try stuff here at Enjoy Church. So we'll try it. How many of you... When you drove in around the back, you saw the added parking lot back there. We have been almost out of space in parking. You've probably noticed that. Um, a lot of our staff and a lot of the people are at O'Fallon today because we have a baptism going on there, and a lot of people are being baptized. But um, the last week, we had a baptism here at Alton. You remember, if you were here... And we had, I think, 23 people, 25 people baptized. That was a lot, 23. And so we're doing that again today in O'Fallon. And if you want to be a part of that, I promise you there's time when we dismiss you can make it to O'Fallon about on the second or third song. All right. All right. So questions, what we're doing is we're answering questions according to the Scripture and where Scripture doesn't directly or specifically answer a question, what we're doing with that is we're looking at the ways of God. And I'll share a, a, one of those examples today. And then where I have an opinion, I'll share that with you. But I, will, I promise you this, I will always share with you, this is my opinion. And I'll share with you why it's my opinion. And then you can, on those issues, we can disagree, and you may have an opinion, I have an opinion, but we never separate on that stuff. We will walk in unity no matter what. I don't, my wife's not here. She's at O'Fallon today, but I don't agree with her <laughs> on everything. On a lot I do. Don't tell her I said it that way, all right? Some things I agree with her on. I'm having fun with you. We agree on 99%. All right, so here's the first question I want to answer today. People ask me this every year, and I know why they do, because there's a verse in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31 that says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, except for the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, Jesus, will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And inevitably, I always have someone through the year, or five someones, come to me and say, Pastor, have I committed the unpardonable sin? And the, let me give you the short, the short of that. If you're asking that question, the answer is no. Because if you had committed that sin in your heart, you wouldn't care. You would not be asking that question. So what does that mean? Well, it means that word blasphemy is the word, and in the Greek, it means a defiant no against God through the Holy Spirit. Because you only, you and I, only come to God through the love and the wooing of his Holy Spirit. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit who draws men unto repentance. 
And when we reject, repentance means that you turn. Repentance, people think that repentance means, sorry, God, and there may be an element of that, but what repentance is is where you were headed away from God, and when the Holy Spirit woos you to God, to Jesus, he's the one always pointing to Jesus, that you turn towards Jesus. You turn towards Jesus. So here's the good news. If you care, you haven't committed that sin. The people who knowingly, and here's the sad part. In the last five years, I have met people who knowingly that have turned from God and verbally out of their mouth blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And three of them were pastors during COVID. Sad, isn't it? Sad, sad, sad. This leads to a similar question that people always inevitably ask, and I want to answer this one, and that is when a Christian commits suicide, do they lose their salvation? Do they go to hell? And I will answer that. The Bible gives us a few examples of of, uh, suicide, One that I think of and probably you think of, and though I think the one that scares a lot of people is Judas. Remember when Judas betrayed Jesus and then Judas committed suicide? And the Bible definitely talks about him being the son of perdition, meaning that he went to hell and that he's in the, it's kind of crazy, but scripture says he is in the deepest, deepest, deepest part of hell, which you may not know this, and this is another thing we can talk about later uh, sometime, either in the series or in another topic. But the Bible talks about the different levels of hell, the different places of hell, and that there are uh, departments of hell. He's in the deepest department, Judas is. And so he committed suicide. I want you to know something. Judas could have repented and could be in heaven today had he repented. We have an example the Bible gives us of someone who denied Jesus the same way and we call him the father of the the church. His name is Peter. Peter denied Jesus on three different occasions. He said, I don't know him. I'm not with him. He denied Jesus and, and yet He repented, and he is in heaven today, and you'll get to meet him someday. Think about that. You'll get to meet the guy that denied Jesus. But don't judge so quick because you're you, and I'm me, and we mess up. Maybe it's not with a denial in that way, but we all need Jesus. And the truth is, is Judas could have turned his life around with repentance. Here's another Old Testament example of of a a suicide situation, and that is he kind of repented at the same time, and that was Samson. Do you guys remember the story of Samson? uh, He was the, the biblical Hulk guy that would turn green. He didn't turn green, but he would destroy the enemy, and I mean, he was a warrior, And let me read this scripture to you. Judges chapter 16 says this. Samson said to the boy who was leading him by the hand, let me touch the pillars. See, this was at the end of his life. He said, and they had gouged his eyes out. The enemy had, Philistines had. And listen to what he did. He said, let me touch the pillars that hold up the building that I, I want to lean on them. He was being kind of sneaky with the enemy and the boy that was charged to oversee him and watch over him. The building was crowded with men and women, and all five Philistine kings were there. Think about this. The enemy was there. All five of them were there, and there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching Samson entertain them. Think about that. In his blindness, they were making sport of him and watching him and making fun of him. And then in verse 28, Samson prayed, Lord, sovereign Lord, What did he do? He came back to God. He said, please remember me, Lord. God, give me strength just one more time. 
with one blow that I can get even with the Philistines who put out my eyes. It's kind of funny to me. You know, he didn't even have a godly response to the situation. He goes, God, I want to get even with them. He prayed a King David type prayer. King David prayers were crazy prayers. They were like, Lord, let flies get in their armpits and chew them out. And I mean, he just was like, you know, uh, he was like that. Okay, so he prayed, Lord, they gouged my eyes out. Let me get even with them. Have you ever, you don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever thought that about one of your enemies? Anyway, he prayed this prayer, Lord, give me strength one more time. And so Samson took hold of the two middle pillars that held up the building, putting one hand on each pillar and pushed against them with all of his strength and shouted, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might and the building fell down on the five kings and everyone else. Samson killed more people at his death than he had killed during his lifetime. But he committed suicide. And you'll get to meet him someday. Kind of crazy. He wasn't perfect. He had lived, up, uh, lived a messed up life, but he turned to God, turned back to God, he was a godly man. He was a godly judge at one time. And then temptation and flesh overwhelmed him, and he gave in to that. So, but let me say this about suicide. So it may sound like I'm giving people permission to commit suicide if you get too tired. Nope, I am not. And I'm going to tell you why. The most dangerous thing about committing suicide is this verse. I want to read it to you. Psalms 139 Verse 16, you saw me, O Lord, before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before I even uh, uh, lived a single day that had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be even numbered. I cannot even count them. They outnumbered the grains of sand. And when I wake, you are still with me. See, here's the biggest thing, and this is what the scripture says, and I love this verse, and I think about this. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your life. In fact, God being God and God knowing what he knows about his overall plan and knowing how much he thinks about you, you are not an afterthought, baby. You were on the heart of God. You were on the mind of God. God planned you. God loves you. God's obsessed with you. Think about what it's saying. He thinks thoughts about you all day long. He is, uh, when you read it in the Hebrew, it means this, that he is, it's funny how the Hebrew says it. It's almost saying this, that he is obsessed like a crazy man about you. Like he's a, he's a stalker in your life. Why? Because he is obsessed with you and he loves you so much and he wants his best to be manifested and given to you in your life. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. You think you love yourself. He loves you to an infinite, unending degree. God is obsessed with you. So much so that he has a plan for your life and literally, in fact, when the scripture in the book of Revelation and the book of 2 Thessalonians talks about the Bema judgment, you and I will stand at the Bema judgment at the end of the seven-year tribu uh, tribulation. We'll be in heaven. Those of you that believe in the rapture, and I am one, I believe in, that God's going to call us up. And we'll be there, and there is a... Think of it this way, those of you that have played sports before, and every year at the sports banquet, they give awards to those who stayed the course and those who performed well. And the Bema is an awards banquet for his saints. It's called the Bema judgment. It's not really a judgment like I judge you as being, you know, guilty or worthy. It's not that. It is a reward acknowledgement for those of you who stayed faithful during all hell and heartache coming against you. 
God is going to have you step forward and he's going to pull out this book that the scripture talks about that exists. And you can read about this book in Revelation that this book is literal. It's not a figurative book. There is literally a book in heaven that has your day recorded, your plan that God has designed for your life. And there is a reward that God will bring you and say, Let, this will be uh, a celebration of you that, look, here was my plan for you. The devil tried to take you out by this car wreck or by this bankruptcy or by this failure, but you got back up and you didn't quit and you kept going. And there is, and look, you prayed when it seemed like nothing was happening. You went to church and you served and you stayed faithful. And God's go, oh, I'm excited about this. God's going to look at you and go, well done, well done, well done, thou faithful and thou, thou good servant. It's coming. But here's the bad thing for those that quit early. Those that say, this is too hard, I'm checking out. You miss that. You disqualify. You'll be in heaven, yes. But you miss the reward. And the reason I'm passionate about it and the reason I'm preaching a little bit right now is because as your pastor, as your pastor, I want to encourage you, even when it gets tough, even when it gets lonely and even when it gets difficult and when it gets hard. Oh, let me encourage you. Come on, we got each other. Stick by our side. Don't you quit. Don't quit. Stay at it. Stay faithful. Get back up. You might hurt for a day, but joy comes in the morning. Come on, come on, come with us. Come on, get up. Get up and get excited about God. Amen. Amen. God loves you. It's okay to get excited, get a little wild once in a while because there are times where it calls for that. What calls for it? My soul calls for it. There are times when, when you get to the end of your rope that you need radical See, I gotta be, uh, I've gotta stay dignified and keep it all together for the appearance because I, I don't wanna get embarrassed. But let me tell you, there comes a time where you don't care what anybody on your left thinks and you don't care what anybody on your right thinks. You gotta get up and you gotta go for it and say, I don't, it don't matter. One of my favorite phrases is, it don't matter. The devil will tell you, you don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to do this or you don't want to do that. Let me just tell you something. It don't matter. By the way, that's a phrase Paul used quite a bit. He said, it don't matter. He didn't say it doesn't matter. <laughs> when, you, when you get to the end of your rope, it don't matter. You got to get back up. So here's what I would say. If you're ever, if you ever feel like, I just want to end it. I understand, but keep living another day. You don't have to worry about another month or another year. Live another day. Live another day because I promise you things will change tomorrow. They'll change tomorrow. And if they don't change tomorrow, they'll change in a day or two. Hey, think about it this way. You're going to live forever anyway. You ain't going nowhere. In other words, you ain't ceasing to exist. That doesn't happen for any soul. You either go to live forever in hell or live forever in heaven. And you know what? That makes you, that makes you an eternal being now. If you really want to live victoriously and successfully, go ahead by faith Faith is now, now faith is. So go ahead and by faith, start living your eternity and your destiny and build up your testimony while you are here and while you still can in this life. In heaven, there are no tears, no sorrow, and you're not gonna have those things. So if you already know that, 
Faith is pulling what is going to come and what has already by faith happened. It's pulling it into the now. Just go ahead and believe for it and go ahead. That's why you can go ahead and get crazy for Jesus right now. And, you, and, and let me tell you what it does. I, I kind of like not having scriptures. You have no idea what you're missing. I'm able to go down the rabbit trail. Pull the plug on that from now on. Let me tell you something. If you re- kind of, I, I use my imagination once in a while just thinking about driving the enemy crazy. I would, I, would, I would love a testimony that, man, you irritated Satan, the devil, so bad by your life because I came at you and pushed and I came after you hard and you just kept smiling and laughing and serving harder and kept faithful. You stayed faithful. What a great testimony that is for you. So make your mind up. You're already living in eternity And let's, by faith, go ahead and fast forward a thousand years. We won't be in the middle of this a thousand years from now. And you've already got the victory. You've already got it. Whether you're walking in it or not now, it's coming. I read the end of the book. Spoiler alert. You win. You might as well go ahead and Live that victory now. Just go ahead and live it now. You got it. You got it. Go ahead and celebrate it right now. Amen. All right. Let me move on with another question or two here. Uh, Do you think receiving the COVID vaccine was receiving the mark of the beast? Well, I'm glad you asked because really here's the truth about this. COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. But it, let me tell you what it is. It, it, this mandate was. The mandate was a, I'll be sensitive because whether you did or you didn't get the vaccination, it, that's not the issue. But people have asked me, several people have asked this question. Here's what it, when the, when, I'll give you a little opinion, okay? This, this part's opinion. When the government tells you you got to do something, mm, when the government tells you, you should be able to choose that on your own. When the government says they are one step away from this, and I want to read to you what it says, because we know what the scripture says that Governments want to typically, this is why the United States is such a blessing because this is a government by the people and for the people. And when the government wants to control your life, your money, your decisions, did you know that the United, uh, United Nations and the United States is a member of the United Nations that their plan is by 2025 to have a digital identification system. And this digital identification system is one step away. If not, it could be what the book of Revelation talks about in Revelation 13, the mark of the beast. It says in Revelation 13, 16, the Antichrist required... the government should only require that we have, really, I'm serious, should only require that we abide by the moral values that are listed in the scripture. The government should not tell you where to live, what city to live in, what vaccinations to get. I know this might, I know there are people who feel different. I'm just going to tell you, they The government should not be able to tell you what you put in your body. It should be your choice of what you put in your body. And you may say, Pastor, you are really passionate about that. I am because I read the word and I see what's happening. So he says, the Antichrist will require everyone small, great, 
rich, poor, free, slave, everyone to be given the mark on their right hand or their forehead. And no one without this digital ID could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number that represents his name. And then in the reason that it is dangerous because someone else asked the question, what if you did get the mark of the beast? Does that condemn you? Well, I'm going to let you be the judge of that, but I'm going to read a verse that I would not take that mark. I would, let me say it again. I would not take that mark. Listen, that, they, they'll, the scripture says they'll chop your head off. They're going back to that type of execution is chopping heads off. Lose your head. Don't lose your soul. Because listen to what this verse says. You didn't know you were coming to church for this, did you? <laughs> Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw the thrones and I saw people sitting on them that had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue nor, here you go, nor accepted the mark on their forehead or their hand. They all came to life again and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Let me tell you the time frame of this. So there is a rapture that the Bible talks about and boy, we are so close. When you look at the prophecy and you look at the timing, we are so close. What does that look like? In the twinkling of an eye, which is faster than an eye blink, we will be with him. But before that, right before that, those who have already died will rise and be with him. And then those that are left, which very well, biblically could be us, will be caught up in the air with him. You want to read that? It's in Second Thessalonians. And you'll be caught up with him if you're still here. Now, here's the amazing thing. So during the seven years that we're going to church, people will still be receiving Christ. The mark won't be, won't be mandated. It might be available, but it'll be optional. At the three and a half year point, it will be mandated. It will be you have to take the mark. And if you refuse to do it, you will be beheaded. <laughs> Good news, the gospel of Jesus. <laughs> it is good news because this thing, all this is wrapping up. Well, at the end of the seven-year point of time, those that were beheaded during that seven-year time, they will have, so there's a second raising and rapture. The second raising and rapture will be those that receive Christ during the tribulation. And so a lot, listen, I have pastor friends that won't preach on this topic because it's a little mind boggling and it puts a little fear in people and they think I'm crazy for preaching about it. I'm thinking you're crazy for not because it's the word of God. It's God's word. And first thing the book of Revelation says is, it says, blessed are those who hear this teaching and read these words. So you being in church today, those of you listening online, you are blessed for hearing this today. There is a blessing for doing this. And so I would encourage you, Anytime, this is just me, and it's, this is opinion again, but I think I've got some good biblical background to back this up. Um, when the government tells you you got to, which, by the way, I don't know if you're listening and you're seeing, if you go to Walmart right now or go to any of the stores right now, you're seeing the mask come back out like crazy. I'm like, where are all these masks coming from? Well, because they're saying we've got an election coming up. This is my opinion we got an election coming up. It's coming up 
real soon, in, in 2025, we need some more votes. Let's mail those in and let's send them in electronically so we can kind of control the outcome a little more instead of really making people show up. <laughs> Am I ticking you off? I'm sorry. But <laughs> I, I'm just saying to you, I'm just saying to you, if you disagree with me, we could still be friends and I'll, I'll eat a sandwich with you and drink a coffee with you. Um, but my heart is this. I want to see God's best fulfilled in your life. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, again, as it's talking about the end times, that the church, because the Holy Spirit lives in his people, that the church is the restraining force against, against the evil one, the Antichrist spirit in the land. And boy, here's the deal. The spirit of Antichrist is very strong today. It is very vocal today. It controls our education system. It controls our government system. It controls the financial system. The Bible even says it does that. What is the education system? It's the influence going into our young people today. And so there is a there has been a lifelong propaganda machine. Did you know the scripture says that Satan is the father of lies? And he is the deceiver. And what does a deceiver do? A deceiver gives mis information and disinformation. And I don't know if you know the difference between misinformation and disinformation, but there is a big difference. And that is worthy of a whole message all in its own, what the difference is between mis and dis. And the Bible has a lot to say about the deceiver. And he plays the long game. Satan plays the long game. He'll start on mis disinformation. Both are wrong. And they will, the enemy will do this for years to establish a rooted doubt system within the souls of individuals. But the enemy is so much more successful if the enemy can plant in a society. And that's his goal is to do that. So I'll come back and visit that sometime. But um, anyway, I want you to know, I want you to know this. I love you. I love you. And so I am doing what I have a responsibility to do from the word of God. And that is to, at times, talk about tough subjects. I, my favorite topic is to encourage you in faith and get you all excited and believe in God for your best life. But if I don't address these subjects, I need to go get a different job. This isn't a job for me. This is a mandate, a call from God. Someone asked this question. They said, I don't feel strong faith. If someone were to ask me to explain my faith, I don't know what I would tell them. I still sin a lot. I appreciate their honesty. <laughs> and then they listed, I still have a very bad temper. I have apathy where sometimes I just don't care. I have laziness. I overeat. <laughs> and there's a couple other things here that I won't read. <laughs> this was the confessional booth, so to speak, and uh, via email. And that's okay. But the, you know, they listed those things. And so I want you to know something. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. It says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's not the result of your own efforts, but it's a gift from God so that no one can boast. And I love that because religion, religion, now there's a difference between Believing in God and people say you got religion. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about legalism, 
religion legalism where people heap rules. They look at you and judge you based on maybe appearance or something like that. And we could do that so easily with people, don't we do it? If, if someone is doing our pet sin, we can judge them. And the Bible says, all things are permissible. Not everything is profitable, but, you know, it is permissible how short your skirt is or how you dress or the tattoos that you have. I've talked about that before. But listen, make sure you're not guilty of judging. At the same time, the balance of it is the same time you can look at the fruit of someone's life. And you could say, man, they have, you know, if you're seeing fruit of a Christ follower, you, you know they're a Christian because the Bible does talk about Jesus. Remember when he went to the fig tree and remember he cursed it? Why did he do that? There was no fruit, but the, the thing wasn't about the thing, but everything was about the thing. And what he was saying was this, because he came back, he was waiting for his disciples to come back and say, what was that about? Look at that tree. You cursed it. And he goes, yeah, here's why. Here's why I did that, to teach you guys something. You, we, the world, that knows you have your roots grounded in the kingdom as a child of God, we ought to be able to come up and eat the fruit of the spirit from your life. It doesn't say you're perfect. It doesn't say you're without sin. But it does say this. If you are a follower of Christ, we ought to be able to come up and partake of some love, joy, peace, righteousness, long-suffering. We ought to be able to look at your life and be able to see those things manifested in your life. And when we're in need of some peace, we ought to be able to come up and rub up against you and say, hey, Pastor Eric, look, my mind's in turmoil. I need a little bit of peace. And I ought to be able to go to lunch with Pastor Eric and to be able to sit down with him and the fruit of his life, not that he's preaching at me, but that just being with him brings peace to my mind and to my soul that he brings hope and he brings encouragement. So when you see people who are like the fig tree with absolutely nothing, I mean, it's not that you judge, but you should, I'm just saying on this side of it, you should be able to say, you know what? There's evidence in that life. There's long suffering. There's righteousness. You can see a righteousness. Are you with me? And so I encourage you in that area to rely on God. Here's the key how to do it. Matthew 6, 33, seek and aim and strive. The Amplified Bible says, first at the kingdom of God. And all of these things will be added unto you. Don't worry or be anxious about tomorrow. Stop. That's a tall order, isn't it? Stop being anxious. Stop worrying. Give your heart to the Lord and just know this. God's got today. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. God's got today. See, what you don't want to be is you don't want to be a functional atheist. What's the difference between an atheist and a functional atheist? Well, a functional atheist acknowledges that there is a God, but he lives his life as if there is no God. You can't see any fruit in his life. And you cannot just say, well, God knows my heart. See, you're not, you can't, I've heard people say, man, I I have let God down. No, no, you didn't let God down because you were never holding God up. You might have disappointed God, but you didn't let him down. It's not your responsibility to hold God up. It's your responsibility to be who God made you to be.
Amen? All right. Well, how do you figure God's will for your life? How do you figure the will of God? Just pursue him a little more today than you did yesterday. Go after him. Don't put this spirit of perfection like, man, I let God down again today. No, you didn't. Just pursue God a little more. Hunger for God a little more. If I could encourage you with anything as I leave you today, I would encourage you, stir up the hunger and the appetite. Do you know how to stir your appetite? Eat more. I do it every time. Every time I sit down and eat, it's just a few minutes later, I want to eat again. If I fast and I pull away, I'm like, that wasn't bad. At first, it was a little bad, but you know, the more I fast, the longer I can go without food. Have you ever done that before? But if I really want to eat, and I don't know why I would ever want to gain weight. I do definitely want to gain muscle, but that's not happening right now. I'm going to hang around these guys on the front row. You're talking about protein, yeah. Oh, did you? See, I need some spiritual protein to body build, spirit body build. And we do too. But what's fun is, you know, watching, like I'm learning from these these guys, you know, looking at their strength and them serving the Lord, but they're taking care of their physique as well. Did you know it is the same way with, I, I bet you guys eat, right? Spiritually, the way to get your spiritual physique jacked and ripped is to eat more and then exercise. Show me your faith and your faith without the works, it's dead. But when you eat and now you work, eat and work, you're going to grow. In Jesus' name. Pastor Eric.